North Campus, um, UGA and the Economics and the Terry College to um, assure me, um, there, there's economists that track these kind of things, I think it's kind of interesting, but, but the world economic data indicators are generally, um, are, are generally very positive since about the uh, year 1600 in Western Europe and America because we're derivative culturally from Western Europe. The economic indicators have been up, 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 up. The world economy is getting better over the long term. We're talking long, okay, centuries worth. So what this means is more of the developing world is going to want to live like we do. The title of this paper that I've been dwelling on for so long kind of wraps it all up. They say the rate of increase of honeybees is not keeping pace with the rate of increase of bee-pollinated crops. That's the title of their paper. It's kind of jazzy. You can tell the conclusion right up front, doesn't it? And this is um, trouble you know, for world food production and world economy and uh, quality of the human diet around the world. These are the arguments that we as beekeepers need to take to the non-beekeeping public and to our politicians and to the newspaper people that we talk to. What's at stake is the American way of life, the good life the nice diet that you and I enjoy every day. A significant fraction of it is thanks to bee pollination. And honeybee decline, which is uniquely an American problem, is a direct insult to that way of life. That's what's at stake. Truly global situation. These are the kind of arguments that we take to USDA when we ask them for a research fund. Um, I'm going to talk no more, and uh, you all might have some questions or something. We've covered a lot of ground tonight, and um, I'll let you all ask me. We've got um, six apiaries that are stationary. They're in California, they're in Washington, they're in Nebraska, they're in Michigan, they're in Kentucky, and Pennsylvania, and Florida and Maine. There's eight of them. We are monitoring them for all the basic honeybee health stuff, pathogens, grains of brood, cleanlessness populations and that kind of thing. At the same time, USDA is doing a sister study with migratory operations. And we're using the same data sheet, literally the same data sheet. We crafted it together so that we just be sure that we're all collecting the same data. And this is a four-year project that we'll be doing that. We are looking at that very thing to try to get a handle on the cost of migratory versus stationary beekeeping. We are presenting the first of those data. Many of you all are going to the National Bee Meeting in Orlando this January. Um, we're going to be presenting some of those first year data. Yeah. Yeah, the place is like uh, almond growing part of California. When they get enough bees in there to pollinate those almonds, if they try to leave them, make them stationary, almost all of them die. The, the land cannot support that population. So you've got mm -hmm. to get in there and get out at the die. Yeah, I'm not disputing that, but I'm saying at what cost? I mean, you're going to move them in. We're not talking leaving them there. I'm just talking about <coughs> the fact that they're migratory to begin with. Uh, and we have to ask ourselves at some point, um, at what point do we start pushing back from that scenario? And it's costing us. 
I think these slides show us that they're costing us fundamentally the health of our bees. A lot of things happen more practically. Um, in California, you have these immense um, organizing yards where they drop off thousands of bees within a few acres, and then they resort them, staging areas, and take them out to the farmers. So there's a lot of disease mixing that happens at those occasions as well. Largest bee yard in the world is California. At any given February, most of the beehives in America are in California. Well, the ordinary silencer for bees, does that have any effect on humans? Uh, do you treat the bees with it? Or? It's one of the advantages of this RNA silencing technology is it's extremely specific. They can be tailored for particular genes. In the case of virus, their, their genomes tend to be rather small anyway, so they're relatively easy to tailor make a silencer for a given virus. It does raise the possibility of, um, in the case of viruses, just mutating and just dodging and you know, maybe have a new silencer every other year or something. Kind of similar to what we do with vaccines. That's a possibility, especially with viruses, because they're so, that's the reason viruses are so dangerous, um, because their genomes are so small that it's real easy for them to mutate into a new form really quickly. And that, that stays true, whether it's a vaccine or an RNA silencer. Keith, if I, if I understood the slides correctly, which is the question, um, the um, point you're making that the colony collapse disorder is, is more a United States and Eastern European phenomenon, not a global phenomenon. Um, and then the, to the other point, uh, I really like the hamburger canals, and I think my kids particularly address that one. Mm -hmm. but, but the point being the standard of living, the standard of living increases and you have more pollinated crops that are desired globally. Mm -hmm. Those two pieces put together, it sounds like colony collapse disorder is not the piece that's dragging down the increase or potential increase of honeybees globally, if that makes sense. So what, what is it that's impeding the rate of honeybee growth in the global yeah, region that the CCD question. is affecting the U.S. and Eastern European markets? The question is, um, if, if CCD is a uniquely American and former Soviet Union problem, then what is limiting bees elsewhere in the world? There's a question if it's even limited. You get rid of those two problem areas, and it's a linear positive line that's going up. So it's arguable that there is no problem. You get rid of America and the Soviet Union, bees are cruising. Okay. I think what becomes a problem, though, with that slide C down here on the bottom, the fact that the demand for pollinators, <coughs> I don't know if I, I've got it. <laughs> okay. the screw, there we go. Look at that. I think the problem is the difference in the slope of these lines. The demand for bee pollinated crops is increasing a whole lot faster than the increase in bees. In fact, that was the title of the paper. The two aren't keeping pace. I guess it just extensions that if, if the premise is that globally, as the agricultural production of pollinated crops increases, they begin to replicate the practices of the United States and Eastern Europe. Sure, the question is if, this, if, if there's an overall trend toward greater mechanization and productivity per unit of land, doesn't that almost inevitably lead to an American style of practice? And I think that's arguable. I think another thing that's concerned in developing countries is, for the most part, they don't have standards like we do for environmental protection. And so you get massive deforestation. And, uh, and with that is a whole host of other environmental problems. I think this makes an extremely strong argument for the strategic place of honeybees for environmental protectors. Um, if, you, if, you can, if you can eliminate this deficit so that pollinators are not a limiting factor, then you're going to maximize your yield per acre. And we, we want that because if our yield per acre is marginal, then there's always going to be a motive for the developing farmer to cut down another acre of rainforest. What's the other way you can increase your yield? Increase your <coughs> acres in production or maximize your production per acre. Well, we want maximum production per acre.
so that we can protect as much of the rainforest as we can. Well, if you want to do that, then you had better have lots of pollinators. That's a huge argument for the benefit of honeybees on a global environmental scale. Let me tell you another one. Um, honeybees are a huge strategic investment for humanitarian aid. Um, it kind of works like this. I'm a poor villager in, in name your country. 